Hello and good morning, kind friends and companions. I'm Morgan Donner and continuing with this vaguely historical-ish cottage cabin barn thing, we've made the building, we've added heat, we've added a place to lie down. Next up, I'd really like to add some light. It looks fine right now during the day, but at night it is completely pitch black dark and especially the walk from here to house or house to here either way is an absolute ankle twisting hazard and that will not do. So we need some light. Now you might say, well, just use a flashlight, that'll do. But this isn't exactly the most, you know, beautiful aesthetic thing. We can do better. Something like an oil lamp or a candle, very lovely, but unfortunately not exactly the easiest thing to walk around with. And then of course, wind is a little bit of a problem. If only I could just take this and enclose it safely in something so the wind couldn't get at it. A lantern, that is what I need. I need to make myself a lantern and I am particularly fond of the late medieval to early Renaissance ones that there's these two main styles that they tend to be kind of a, an all metal one that's pierced all over or a wooden one with transparent panels around it. And they're both really cool. I was trying to decide for a little while which way I wanted to go, but we always knew it was gonna be both, right? Now for our metal ones, there are several extant 15th century ones, as well as just an absolute ton of images from manuscripts and paintings and things. So we have a pretty large selection of what they look like. And there was definitely a bit of variety. Some are just all metal, you know, pierced all over to light out in little bits and pieces. Some of them had kind of like a, a little transparent window on the front where the door was. And that was most likely made out of horn, something kind of like this guy. You would have just cut the tip off, then cut it in half and flattened out those panel pieces. And then that would make you a nice little window that unlike a piece of glass, wouldn't be as likely to shatter if you accidentally drop the lantern or something. And this is also relatively cheap because it's a byproduct of other industries, you know, meat and leather and things. So this was an excellent little window alternative of the time. And then for the wood lanterns, those would have been basically the, the window piece of the metal, but all over. <laughs> it would have been wood framing with a bunch of transparent, most likely horn pieces around. You'll actually see in a lot of the paintings that there's kind of like a, a hint of a seam or something going on in the middle of that transparent area. And I think that's because depending on the, the size of the horn you're able to get a hold of, you might need to stack two pieces on top of each other to get the same kind of profile as a candle. I was only able to find one extant version of this particular style of wooden lamp. And unfortunately it is a little bit post medieval. It's from the Mary Rose, which sunk in 1545. So it's a little bit more like Renaissance-y than medieval-y, but <laughs> it's cool though, because you can see in the, the wooden slats on the side, how there's a, a groove, which is where our pieces of horn would have rested in. There's also some really cool versions from the like 1800s that have a wooden frame. And then around that they've wrapped vellum or parchment, which is a type of paper made from animal hides. And that to me, it's just a really cool use of materials. It also would have been very durable, like, it's really neat. Anywho, let's go ahead and get started with the actual making. Let's go for the wood one first. And I always like to start out with drawing out my idea. And in this case, I kind of started getting the rough dimensions that I had in mind for this. And then if you're like me, you show that to your woodworking partner and ask pretty, pretty please if you can use their lathe with a lot of uh, supervision from them. And hopefully being the very kind soul that they are, they will prepare a spare bit of wood that they have lying around from an old project. They're gonna flatten down the surface and then mark the center point and do some really rough cutting so that the initial lathe process isn't quite so rough. That piece of wood gets really firmly attached to the face plate with screws and then the center on the other side gets drilled out which will eventually become the very top of the lantern. This is nice because it gives me a really good firm visual guide to start basing all the rest of my proportions off of and he gave me a nice quick lesson on how to hold and move the tool so that I could remove all the remaining bark and start curving it into a bowl shape. Honestly, usually when it comes to wood projects, I just hand them to him while I work on other parts of the project. But for this one, I really wanted to have the chance to practice using the tools and the machinery myself and learning how the prep goes and just getting some good practice in. Oh, that's good. 
No. Huh. I only did uh, the pointy tool and the roundy tool. Very nicely done. Good finish. Did you hear that? He said it was very nicely done. Then we took that off of the base plate and rotated it 180 and used the hole that he drilled earlier to toss a chuck in there, giving us access to the bottom of the piece that we couldn't really reach before. He drilled the bottom using successively larger drill bits until we had enough room to use the turning tool to remove additional material until we were pretty happy with the overall thickness of the walls. Lastly, he burned some decorative lines into the top because while the inspiration pictures are mostly functional pieces, I feel like there's often like a little hint of embellishment around it and I just really, really like the way that the burning lines looks. For the base of the lantern, I grabbed a piece of the same tree, marked out the center the way he showed me, cut out the rough shape with my birthday bandsaw and then stuck it onto the lathe and then cut a channel to match the depth of the lip on the upper piece that we had made earlier. A little bit of tidying up with sandpaper and then I removed the screws and called this good enough. While I was working on that, he started working on the upright pieces. He got them cut to the right width and height and then he did some quick additional cuts to make it really, really easy to just chisel off the rest of the unnecessary parts until we were left with just the middle bit. Then I smoothed that section out with a little bit of whittling, aiming to get it nice and round, get the corners removed, so it was kind of like a dowel. Once I got that part nice and rounded out, I then wanted to make the respective holes in the previous two lantern pieces. I matched it up to a drill bit about the right size, and then I did a few test holes and some scrap to verify what size I liked best, and then, you know, I was ready to drill in the real deal. Always do some tests and scrap, like, it's much better to figure out what you like best in a piece that you don't care about than to, to start drilling away the thing you do care about. Most of the lanterns I saw in pictures seemed to have four or five or six of the panels and I decided that I like the look of six the best so that's what we're going for. I drilled the top dome piece first and then I matched it up with its bottom mate and made markings so that the holes would line up as perfectly as possible with each other. In addition to the holes, I wanted to add little interior supports so I chiseled away a section next to each hole to the appropriate size so that my little support piece would fit in there. You can see here how the interior and exterior framing will kind of work next to each other and in between those two is going to go my parchment. Yes, I did decide to go with the parchment, even though it's not quite as documentable as the horn would be. I just, I really dig those 18th century examples and I wanted to see if I could make that work with this design. Now in my chosen reference images, I feel like you can see the wooden supports, not only on the outside of it, but also on the inside when you can see inside. And I like the way that looks, so I didn't want to do the later version of just wrapping the parchment around the frame. I, I really wanted to try and achieve that more medieval look. So fingers crossed this works. First, we need to finish off the inside though. While we still have easy access to it, I'm gonna make the actual candle holding part out of a piece of sheet tin. Just fold down that top edge to reinforce it a bit, smooth it out, form it into a cylinder, and then cut the bottom so that we can flare pieces both in and out. We're gonna use these little flaps to secure it to the base. I noticed that in a lot of the reference images, it seemed like there was a split in the base. And so I figured let's go ahead and include it. I have a feeling that it's so that it's easier to clean the piece out. Also, it gives it a little bit of flex depending on the size of your candle. You might want to squish it in a little bit or let it flare out a bit. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and include it just in case it's integral to the design. Next up is forming a loop at the top of the lantern. I bought some 3 16 rod and then bent it around a roll of paper to get it to the right shape and then removed the excess with bolt cutters. I drilled a couple of holes into the top and then promptly got distracted with patterning out the parchment interior on that same roll of brown paper. Once I was pretty satisfied that I had the right size for the paper layout, I cut it out of the parchment and then used a bit of wood to make a reinforced edge for the door. First I scored the surface to make it easier to fold, did the pre-folding on all those lines, and then added a touch of glue to the inside before rolling the wood up inside. I did let that dry for a few hours and while it's probably okay as is, I don't quite fully trust that the glue is going to 100% hold things, especially once the lantern's in use and it's getting heated up and then left in the cold and then heated up and cold. 
I feel like it's better if we reinforce the glue just a little bit by marking out some even lines and then drilling those out with the tiniest drill bit I've got and then stitching through everything with a double running stitch using some sinew thread. That should hold this very securely. All right, our moment of truth has arrived. It's finally time to put all of this together. I found a gunky brush for glue application purposes. Aligning up the holes. Oh wait, glue. As I put the lid on for the second time, I realized that the uprights on the inside were not staying put and with the paper in the way, I can't really reach in to fix them. So we're gonna have to try something different. It's probably a terrible idea, but I'll give it a try. There's enough kind of play in the space between the inside and outside slats that I'm hoping I should be able to just slip the paper in. A few hours later and the glue is all dry. I've cut down the excess because I added some extra just to make sure I had enough to properly go all the way around and enclose the front and everything. And I think, I think we are solidly done. All that is left is to toss a nice little beeswax candle in there and see what it looks like once it gets a little bit darker outside. I'm really, really excited not only to see this in its beautiful lit up lantern glory, but also uh, it's gonna be so cool to compare this one to the tin lantern because they they let out light differently, right? This is sheer, whereas the tin lantern is pinpricks of light. And I have my theories about what each of them is more useful, like what situations you'd prefer one versus the other. And, but I don't know. I won't know until I give them a bit of a test. And I'm really, really excited to see what happens. Speaking of the Tin Lantern, Mr. Morgan Donner knew that this was in my plans to make and he saw this cool kit online where they have all the tools and instructions all in there already for you. So he bought that for us to make a pair of lanterns together. He's gonna go with a copper version to kind of test out that and it'll be really, really pretty if it works out. I'm gonna use the original tin that comes with the kit and we will see how the two methods compare in the end. Oh. First things first is gonna be the main rounded body. So it looks like it does have the first step be cut the different lines in and fold them however they need to be folded and then do the decoration embellishment. So now I have marked out all of the lines for the main body of the lantern. And on here, we've got several instructions for where to cut in and then fold down different elements of the lantern so that they have a nice smooth edge. Also so that some of the different pieces can lock into each other. So next up is cutting. Mighty tin snips. That wasn't so bad. I went ahead and clamped this bar to the edge of my table to help protect it from the mallet blows that are gonna come next. It was a lot of fun to experiment with a lot of different things we had around the house to try and complete various steps in the process. We often ended up doing a slightly different thing each to kind of see what might work best. The drywall is a pretty good surface to work into. Nice, because it has like a little bit of give, but not too much. Yeah. I guess we'll find out how, the, <laughs> how this uh, rubber mat compares. We even handmade a couple of quick tools whenever nothing we had on hand was quite doing what we wanted. Oh, fascinating. Well, that's supposed to make sense. More even distribution of force. Turning the top edge of the tin makes it a lot more smooth and nice to the touch, a lot less pokey and sharp than the raw cut edge is, as my hands can unfortunately attest. It's like a billion little paper clips on here right now. So uh, also, if you're using Sharpie, try to watch out where you're putting the, the pieces of your project because just watch. In three, two, one, there. I am now going to have a piece of marker on my face for the rest of this video. It's like a, it's like a fun little Easter egg. Keep an eye out for it. All right, next step. 
I was looking for a original, original, an extant kind of version to copy, but I didn't see anything that was honestly terribly different from what's already here. I think that to give it my own little flair, maybe I will go with like a heart version of the, like the same design, just mm -hmm. in a heart shape instead of a circle. That way it's like a little different and fun, um, but I'm also not straying too far and making things super difficult for myself, so. All right, now we punch for one million years. It's pretty much a million years, I can attest. You've gotten so far, it looks so good though. Yeah. I really love putting together projects like this, especially when there's a little bit of wiggle room to add my own slightly different decorative touches. I think that the heart design variation worked out really, really well for this. I'm about halfway through my punching with my, my little heart design here, and you are all done punching. You've also made it into a cylindery shape. You've already started on your next piece here. Which is the base. for the bottom of the, the lantern. Yep. Yep. Nice. So I have finished the kind of outlines of the hearts here. And next I can switch from the, the little pointy punch tool to the one that like makes cute little lines, which looks really, really, really nice on his. So I'm excited to get to work with this one now. Now that I've finished up my heart to the my heart's content. I'm gonna go ahead and also roll it into a little tube like this, which is gonna be very fun. It does not it does not want to do rolling right now. And then after that, I will cut out the little bottom circle, which he's already moved on to trying to uh, uh, attach the, the tin to the bottom so that it has the thing that holds the candle. That was all very excellently worded, but I'm sure you get the idea. I have not yet made the little circle bit that'll hold the candle yet, but I feel like I wanna test how well I can make the pieces solder together with some scraps, just to verify that I'm able to make that happen. So let's take some scraps and do some test pieces. So now I am gonna go ahead and connect my candle holder to the base of the lantern. And uh, unfortunately we had to go through several rounds of different solders and leads and uh, fluxes and things trying to figure out what combination worked because it's very fussy. But I think I hit upon the winning combination uh, with my little testers. So let's see how we do. First thing is going to do a teeny tiny bit of flux on the seam here where the, the two parts connect. So let's, let's give her a go. I think that is a success. We have a stuck little candle holder double here. And now I think I can put this bottom into the bottom of my lantern itself. So ideally, I should be able to lock these edges in so that they overlap and kind of do a, ah! do a this thing, you know, lock in. All right. Attempt number two. Turns out I need to pull out my little edges here just a little bit more. Let's see now if it's happy. Yeah, I got I got one seam to kind of see in. Oh, all right. Got more soldering to help keep it all in place. So I have finished my bottom, my my body of the the lantern. So I am gonna also cut out a little semi-circle sort of piece and start punching away. I will probably go ahead and actually properly just do the pattern as per. Oh no, you're changing it up. You're doing a, you're doing a whoop whoop mm -hmm. sort of. Mm -hmm. Nice, yes. I like it. Time to do the cone of mine and I'm going to add some flux all the way down here so that I can solder it closed. Now that I have completed my own little mini hat to go on top of my, my lantern here, I next need to make the little tabs that are gonna help provide something for this to hold onto. Now I could, in theory, 
just sort of attempt to solder those two edges together, but the instructions have some little clips, tabs, that you add into the inside to help make a separate little thing to solder stuff to. We ended up finding out that you can't actually quite follow the instructions exactly as given, or you could, but it would block some of the holes, which would be a bummer. But whatever the case, we were able to make the tabs work, and then we got them soldered in place, and then for the top, I made this little ruffle piece by folding it back and forth on my marked lines until it condensed down to make kind of a fluted cone shape. Now the older lanterns seem to have quite a lot of variation going on. Some are just the smooth cone part, some are a more ridged or fluted cone at the top, some of them have multiple pieces or just the one. This particular pattern did include this little roughly bit at the top, so I figured I'd go ahead and add it. I did accidentally make the hole of the smooth cone just a little bit too big, so I had to make a second miniature little fluted cone so that I could hold the wire, but once that was added in, I was able to thread all of these top pieces together, including the final ring, which is just a strip with the edges folded over so that they're not as sharp as they would be otherwise. And then I tucked the wires in so that everything was very neat and tidy. Last part is just going to be making the door, which is a lot more well thought out than my wooden door, if I'm gonna be honest. We'll do the decorative design first, draw it in, punch it, and then there's these little metal hinges that we're going to bend so that they fit nicely around the sturdy wire. And then that's gonna go tucked right into this notched area of the door. We pinch down the remaining edge of the frame and then the wire stays put. It's so easy, so clean. By the way, Sharpie is really easy to clean off with isopropyl alcohol. So if you messed up your design earlier in the process and wanna redo it, or you just wanna clean off any remaining parts at the end, keep that in mind. One thing I did not keep in mind was the fact that the hinges are gonna go here on the side, which means I'm going to have to cover up parts of the heart, which is not ideal, but c'est la vie. I doused it with flux and solder until the hinges stuck. This isn't exactly my most neat and tidy work, but it's functional, I'll take it. I also soldered on a little latch. It's just made with a pinched piece here so that it sticks up off the edge. And then this little loop-de-loo -loop part that gets threaded on there. Easy peasy. I would say that if I were to do this again, I'd make this hand holdy part a bigger loop just so it's easier to grab. It's, this is a little, a little tight. All right, we are outside testing our first time candle lit lanterns and check it out. Obviously, you, I feel like the camera is not picking up any of the shadows, but you can at least see the, the nice candle litness. <laughs> You're just, oh, we can kind of see you now from far away. Yay! <laughs> so yeah, like this is definitely, I know again, camera's not great at picking it up, but this is absolutely enough to like walk by in the, the middle of the night when it's really dark. Not to mention, it's blowing pretty solidly right now. Probably like 50 mile an hour winds. And um, these candles, they're flickering a little bit, but not going out by any means. Oh yeah, like there's a lot of wind and these, I don't think we're in danger of the, the candles going out. It's trying. The wind is trying so hard. <laughs> and they both survived. Yay. A little fun fact. Tin is actually the traditional 10 year anniversary gift material. So if you were looking for a fun project to do with your partner, I can recommend, it's very fun. The initial light up tests with the lanterns went pretty well, I'd say, but I'm really curious to see them together side by side in the dark. Look at those pretty little lanterns. It's very bright. This is very pretty in like the way it puts out light. I am seeing how well I, and see our face. It was really neat to get to see the two lanterns together and how they really put off light very differently. And I can absolutely see how they would be useful in some circumstances more than others. I noticed in a lot, a lot, a lot of the imagery I saw was that often the front door is open. And this is very flashlight-esque. Mm -hmm. If you're wanting to get from point A to point B and not like kind of blind yourself, that's a great way to go because you can have the door facing the direction that you're going. 
Whereas with the wooden one, because it's light everywhere, to me, that makes it feel like it's better if maybe you've got a group of people so like everybody's trying to kind of see. And in fact, you actually see a lot of scenes where someone has it kind of held up really high so that multiple people in the scene can probably see what's going on. Like that makes more sense to me now that I've kind of seen it in action, which is really cool. I, I dig that part of making projects. All right, I had a lot of fun. I hope you guys had fun watching and I will see you guys next time. Hello. What are you still doing here? You silly gooses? Well, I guess while you're still here, I feel like I should maybe tell you a little bit about my next planned project that's noodling around up in here. I'm thinking something a little bit kinder to my hands. Maybe paint, wouldn't that be fun? Maybe painting something very big, yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? You know what? I think I could use y'all's input on that. Like, wouldn't it be cute if I included a bunch of everybody's favorite flowers and animals and tools? I love tools. Yeah, why don't you, if you're interested in participating, pop on down to my description where you can find a link to my Patreon. I think I'll post a poll or maybe a form or some, I'll post something there and you guys should enter in what you think I should add to this big painting project. Yeah, that'll be great. I hope to see you there. Okay, but for reals, I gotta go.